that. <coughs> All right, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, so, as mentioned, the topic of my PhD is Antarctic astronomy. So when you first hear that, it might sound like a bit of a weird idea, doing astronomy in, in Antarctica. So if you picture Antarctica in your head, you're probably thinking of something a bit like this. It's cold and there's blizzards and snow and icebergs and penguins and it's all just a, it's terrible conditions. And you, you do get some of that in Antarctica, but it's a very big continent. It's bigger than Australia. So there's lots of space to have uh, different environments. So you get all this stuff down on the coast, but out in the center of the continent, it's very different. It looks a bit more like this. This is one of the photos I took. So out here, uh, the weather's amazing. It's a nice, beautiful, clear skies, not a cloud. Uh, low winds, nice and calm. It's, um, there's no rain. It's uh, barely even snows out there. So it uh, turns out this is actually a really good place for astronomy. So when astronomers are looking for somewhere to put their telescopes, there are a, a few things they're looking for in a site. Um, they want to find somewhere where obviously the skies are clear, where there aren't too many clouds. Um, they want to find somewhere that's high up in the atmosphere. So you want to be up on top of a mountain or somewhere at a very high elevation. So you can get up above as much of the atmosphere as you can. Um, you also want to be far away from cities to avoid all the light pollution and dust and smog that those generate. And Antarctica fits these uh, perfectly. It's, as you can see, beautifully clear there. Um, the center of the continent is up at a very high altitude. So you're up, up above the atmosphere and you can't really get any further away from the lights of cities. Uh, there's another interesting benefit. Because Antarctica is at the South Pole, you, in summer you get six months of continuous daylight, and then in winter you get six months of continuous darkness. So when you want to observe things in the night, you have six solid months of observation time. So you can observe one object for a long time. Uh, so before I get to my trip to Antarctica, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the research I'm doing and why we want to go all the way down to Antarctica to... Uh, so I set up our telescope. So my research is looking at molecular clouds. So these are huge clouds of gas and dust out in space. So here's a nice photo, I think maybe from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, this is called the Horsehead Nebula, because you can see this little bit here looks a bit like a horse's head, if you use your imagination. Um, these clouds are made up 90% of hydrogen molecules. So see I've got little diagrams here, two uh, hydrogen atoms bonded together. Uh, so they're 90% they're hydrogen, and then about 10% helium, and then a very small percent other atoms like carbon and oxygen that are mixed in with the rest of the cloud. And molecular clouds are the places in our galaxy where stars are born. So gravity pulls all the gas and dust together, and it collapses down into a bunch of dense cores, and then they ignite to form a, form a new generation of stars. So they're, they're quite interesting places. Um, if we want to know how the galaxy works, how the stars go through their life cycles and, and are born and die, we need to understand how molecular clouds work and how they form and what their structure is. Um, but there's a, a little bit of a problem with that, is that they're quite hard to see. So molecular clouds are very cold. Out in the depths of space, they're only about 10 degrees above absolute zero. So they're, they're extremely cold, so they don't glow brightly like stars do. Um, so you can only actually see the Horsehead Nebula here. Whoops, that's the wrong button because it's blocking out this uh, glow from behind. But there are lots of clouds where there isn't a light source behind them, so you can't see the cloud that way. So for objects that aren't glowing brightly, like stars, astronomers look for specific wavelengths of light that are given off by excited atoms and molecules in the cloud. So this pink glow in the background here is from excited uh, hydrogen atoms. So they give off this particular reddish-pink wavelength. Um, but the problem with a um, dense molecular cloud like this is that it's too cold to excite the hydrogen atoms. So instead, astronomers look for different atoms that are mixed in with the cloud that do give off uh, light when they're quite cold. So one popular molecule that astronomers use is carbon monoxide. So it's one carbon bonded to one oxygen. So I mentioned before that there's a very small percentage of other molecules mixed in with the cloud. So there'll be a small percentage of carbon monoxide molecules in there too. And these molecules do get excited at low temperatures, and they give off radio waves. So you can detect them with a radio telescope. So this telescope here is uh, called MOPRA. It's in Coonabarabran here in New South Wales. And some other people in the department, like the, my colleagues here, are using this telescope to uh, scan the galaxy and look for molecular clouds using carbon monoxide. They're actually observing right now. I think Michael's got the current shift. So the stuff I'm working on is quite similar to that, but instead of looking for carbon monoxide, I'm looking at individual carbon atoms on their own. 
So the carbon monoxide molecules can get broken up by high energy photons and just get individual carbon atoms. So they also give off their own particular wavelengths of radiation. But it's a little bit of a problem there that they give off radiation in the terahertz portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So this here is a diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum. So electromagnetic radiation comes in a range of different wavelengths. So visible light, all the different colors you can see, is this little bit here in the middle, all the way from violet to red. So all the light you can see it occupies only a very small portion of the spectrum. If you look at longer wavelengths, you go to infrared, like using thermal imaging cameras, uh, microwaves, like in a microwave oven, and radio waves, like radio towers and telephone towers and things. Um, shorter wavelengths, you've got ultraviolet radiation, which gives you a sunburn if you stay out in the sun too long, and X-rays and then gamma rays. So carbon gives off radiation in this little bit of the spectrum here called terahertz, in between infrared and microwaves. Uh, terahertz isn't really used that much because there's a little bit of a problem is that it's blocked by water vapor in the atmosphere. So this, little, this diagram here shows you how much uh, radiation can get through the atmosphere down to the ground. So you can see there's a nice big window here at radio wavelengths. Radio waves can easily get through the atmosphere down to the ground, so we can build radio telescopes and look at radio sources out in the galaxy. Visible light is also quite good at getting down to the ground, so we can build optical telescopes, and that's why you can see the stars at nighttime, because the light can get uh, through the atmosphere down to you. But terahertz is in this bit here, so it's almost entirely blocked by the atmosphere. So I mentioned that uh, water vapor in the air blocks terahertz radiation very well. Um, if you had a terahertz telescope in this room, it wouldn't be able to see to the back wall. There'd just be too much water vapor in the atmosphere blocking all the signals. So if you want to uh, be able to observe terahertz radiation from space, you need to put your telescope somewhere that's very, very dry, where there's hardly any water vapor in the atmosphere at all. And fortunately, there is a place on Earth like that here in Antarctica. So I mentioned that the uh, weather is fantastic there. And it's, it's an incredibly dry place. Because it's so cold, uh, water vapor in the air freezes and crystallizes out and falls down to the ground. Um, so this is actually one of the driest places in the world. Uh, it, it, you can see there is snow everywhere, but it's so cold that it st always stays frozen and never melts. So there's no liquid water available. And this is a map here of Antarctica, uh, where the color shows the elevation. So the red areas around the edge are at sea level. And up here in the center, the blue and purple regions are up, uh, much higher. So this little bit here in the middle is up at 4,000 meters. That's uh, about twice as high as the tallest mountain in Australia. So it, it's uh, very high up there. Um, and so my group has put a telescope right in the middle out here at this place called Ridge A, where the uh, arrow is pointing. So right there. So that's uh, right up in the middle of the, the highest point of the plateau, which means we're up above a lot of the atmosphere. So we can avoid a lot of water vapor that way by get, trying to get above it, and then we're in the, the driest spot we can find. So that's another way of avoiding uh, all the water vapor. But it's uh, a very remote location. So no one's there to operate the telescope for most of the year. It sits by itself in the snow running remotely. And we can control it from here in Sydney. Uh, we've got a satellite connection to it. We only send people down once per year to do maintenance and work on it, refuel the engines, fix anything that's broken, do upgrades, all that sort of things. Uh, so at the end of 2014, I was lucky enough to go down on one of these maintenance missions to work on the telescope. That brings me to the next part of my talk. Uh, this is my trip down to Antarctica to work on the telescope. So I started in December 2014, at the start of summer, when it's uh, the warmest in Antarctica. Don't want to go down in winter. Um, so this is the path we took to get down to the telescope, because it's so remote we have to go down in a, number of, a bunch of steps. So we start here in Sydney, fly over to Christchurch, then down to McMurdo Station on the coast of Antarctica, then all the way down to the South Pole Station, and then from there out to Ridge A, where our telescope is. Uh, so the, the first stop is the United States Antarctic uh, Program base in Christchurch. So my group is collaborating with a group from the University of Arizona. So we built all the engines and power supply and control systems, and they built the actual telescope itself, and we're working together to set it up um, out in Antarctica. So we go down with the United States program. And this base in Christchurch is sort of the hub of all of their Antarctic projects. So all of these things they send down go through Christchurch. And so we had to go there to get a lot of our things ready. One of the important uh, things we need is our gear. So as you know, Antarctica is very, very cold. 
So you need a lot of warm clothing to be able to survive there and, and work. Um, so this place issues you with all of the gear you need. You don't need to bring any of your own warm clothes. Um, so while, while you're working down there, you'll be wearing quite a lot of warm layers. You have uh, several thermal underlayers, polar fleece, um, big heavy overalls called car hearts, uh, your boots, your hats, your gloves, your goggles, and this, uh, the big red jackets to, to go on the top. So these are the boots you get issued. They're called FDX boots, and they are fantastic. They're, they're huge and heavy, so it's a lot of weight to carry on your feet, but they are very warm. So even when you're walking around in the snow all day in the coldest temperatures, your feet stay nice and warm there. It's amazing. So once we got all our stuff ready in Christchurch, got all our, our gear issued, the next step is to get down to Antarctica itself. And so to do that, we travel down in one of these. This is a C-130 Hercules uh, military transport aircraft. So they're, they're fairly old planes. They've been around for a while, and they're quite noisy inside, and they're not very fast. But they're, they're very good at uh, hauling cargo. And one of the big advantages this plane has is that it's got skis. You can see there's a ski mounted around the wheel there, which means that it can land on snow runways in Antarctica. So there's a lot more options of places where you can land. So they are the, the primary transport down to Antarctica for the American program. So this is what it looks like while you're in the plane. So, uh, so here's me and a couple of my team members, uh, David and Craig, and the other, my other team member, Nick, was the one who took the photo. So it's just a team of four of us going down to work on the telescope. And we're all crowded in the plane like that. I think there are about 40 people on that flight, and it's about an eight-hour journey. So it's, it's pretty crowded. Um, we've got all of our warm gear on so that we're ready to step off the plane into Antarctica. <laughs> But while we're on the plane, they've got the heaters on. They're blowing hot air on our faces. So it gets way too hot. So you can see David's taken his off there. Um, I also got this cool photo out the window. The window is up there in the photo. So it's a bit awkward to look out of. It's sort of too high up behind you. But I managed to sort of hold my phone up behind me and snap a photo out the window. And you get this fantastic view here out across the ocean near Antarctica. So you can see all the uh, floating sea ice. And then in the distance, the continent itself. So the, the plane flies down to land in McMurdo, but sometimes McMurdo gets very bad weather. You get snowstorms and whiteouts, and you can't see anything. If the pilot's in a whiteout, you've got white snow in the air and then white snow on the ground, they can't see anything, they can't land. And if that happens, you have to, the only other place to go is back to New Zealand. So you might have to fly all the way down to Antarctica. Not, weather's not good enough. Turn around and fly all the way back. That's called a boomerang flight. Uh, fortunately, we, that didn't happen to us. We got down there first try, nice and clear. So the first stop in Antarctica is McMurdo Station on the coast. So uh, here it's about minus three degrees Celsius in the summer. So it's, it's a bit cold, but it's not too bad. You can wear a few layers. It's, it's fine outside. Um, this is the largest station in Antarctica. There's about 1,000 people there in the summer. So it's like a small town all of its own. And there are a lot of different scientific projects that go on in Antarctica. Um, there are climatologists who go out and collect ice cores to study climate change. There are geologists who study the nearby volcano. This base is built right next to Mount Erebus, which is the southernmost active volcano in the world. Um, I met some other physicists who were studying the Earth's magnetic field. They're going around placing magnetometers at different points to measure any changes. Um, and there are biologists who go out and look at penguins and the sea life and other things you find in Antarctica. Um, so this, I took this photo from the uh, hill overlooking the base. You can see all these big tanks here in the foreground. Those are all fuel tanks. So fuel is very important in Antarctica because you need it for everything, all the power for all the bases, all the heating, all the vehicles, all the aircraft. They all run on this, uh, this one fuel. So, and this base supplies every other American station in Antarctica. So it's a very important uh, resource there. Uh, so while I was in McMurdo, I had a bit of time to look around. Um, there are a few labs there where other scientists are doing their work. So in one of the biology labs, the biologists there have collected some of the sea life that you can find in Antarctica, and they put them in a touch tank. So they had a tank of water in one of their labs where you can put your hands in and touch these weird sea creatures that they've found. So this thing is a giant sea spider. So it's about that far across. It's a big, giant collection of legs. And this other one is a giant isopod. Um, there's a bunch of other things there as well. There's fish. There's a, this yellow thing here is called a sea lemon, apparently. So you're allowed to touch them if, if you want to. I, I've decided, no, no, I don't think I want to touch those. I think I'm fine with that. So uh, while we were at McMurdo, we had to get ready for the rest of our trip, which meant doing field training. Because our telescope's out at a remote site in the field, we need to practice and prepare for uh, living and working out there. 
So that means driving out onto the ice sheet in one of these. This is a Hagland vehicle. They can get over pretty much any terrain. They use them a bit in Antarctica. Uh, so we drove out onto the ice sheet near McMurdo Base, and we sort of practiced all the skills we'd need to use out in the field, like setting up our tents, so that how you can, like how they set up, how to peg them down. Um, we practiced building a snow wall. So you might be able to see behind here, there are some blocks of snow all stacked up. Uh, because it can get quite windy in Antarctica, you want to build a wall out of blocks of snow along one side of your tents to keep the wind off. You don't want them blowing away while you're trying to sleep. And we also practiced using the radio to call back to the base. You have to call in every day to check that you're still all right. And we finished all that field training pretty quickly that day. We had a bit of time left over, so we decided to build an igloo. <laughs> That's it. So it uh, took quite a lot of work. You could dig all the blocks of snow out, cut them into square shapes, stack them up in a circle. Fell in a couple of times while we were making it. Didn't quite, it took a bit of work, but we, we eventually got the, the hang of it. The trick is to make the blocks all wedge-shaped. So you can stack them together in a circle, and then they won't fall in. Then you can make the next step a little bit smaller, and the next one smaller, and gradually meet up in the middle. Just a handy tip there in case anyone's ever building an igloo. Um, so there's, there's me standing up inside. We made it way bigger than a real igloo would be. And then we uh, cooked our dinner in there. We have um, camp stoves and cooked some uh, dehy food, uh, dehydrated meals. You have the things in packets. Just add boiling water to cook it. And then we slept out in the tents. Decided not to sleep in the igloo just in case it fell in again. <laughs> all right, field training all done. We're all ready for the next step. That is to travel to the South Pole Station. And so to travel there, we flew in a Hercules again, another C-130. Um, this is a bit shorter. It's only a five-hour flight. And uh, on the way, we fly over the Trans-Antarctic mountain range. So there's this huge mountain range that runs across the length of Antarctica. So you can see these mountains are stretching out into the horizon there. And this here is a huge glacier winding its way down the valley as the ice slowly grinds its way down the hill. And here we are arriving at the South Pole Station. So this is, it's called the amundsen Scotts South Pole Station after the first two explorers to reach the South Pole, uh, Roald Amundsen and Robert Falcon Scott. And here the temperature is about minus 20 degrees. So this is where it starts getting really cold. You really need all that warm gear that you get given. It's also up very high. The altitude's about 3,000 meters here. So the air starts getting quite thin. You get out of breath quite easily. But you can already start seeing the, the nice clear skies. It's a beautiful sunny day there. This is the actual station itself. Um, so the door is in here. So you climb up some steps behind those curtains. And so you can see the whole station is raised up on legs. So in Antarctica, the wind blows the snow around. And if you have any building or object in the snow, that stops the wind, and it drops all its snow and piles up against it. So everything slowly gets buried by the snow over time. So the idea with having it up on legs is that the wind can blow underneath it and take the snow with it, and it stops it piling up so much. And that's, that's mostly working. You can see the snow is a bit piled up around the sides, but it's a lot better than just having it flat in the snow. Uh, is the front door to the station. You can see it's a big, heavy, insulated door like you'd find on a freezer, but in this case, you're keeping the cold out rather than in. And on the inside, it's uh, very nice and modern. Um, there's, uh, I've got lots of facilities. There's rooms for 150 people to stay there. There's a galley where they serve three meals a day. Um, there's lots of entertainment there. So they've got a library. They can check out books. There's a craft room where you can make things. They've got two TV lounges with a huge array of TV shows and movies for people to watch. Um, there's a, they've got a gym with a basketball court. Uh, there's a greenhouse where they grow plants over winter. There's even a sauna. So if you're at the South Pole feeling a bit cold, you can go and have a sauna and warm up again. Um, it's a room where they basically heat it up so it's really, really hot. You can go and sit, sit in a very hot room. Um, so this is the galley where they serve all the meals, uh, three meals per day. Um, it's, it's surprisingly good. All the food there... Well, most of it has been frozen because it's hard to transport things without freezing them. But it's, it's just like any sort of canteen you'd get. Occasionally, you get uh, fresh fruit brought down from New Zealand. You get kiwi fruit quite often. And this is my room at the station. So they're quite small rooms, but it's very nice, especially when you think about the conditions outside. And so I mentioned that in Antarctica, so the sun doesn't go in its normal pattern around the sky. Instead, it just goes in a circle because you're at the South Pole. So the sun just goes round and round every day and it never sets during summer. So while I was there, I, I was in Antarctica for six weeks in total, no sunsets, just continuous daylight. So you have to basically rely on your watch to know what time it is. We've got to know when meals are, know when you should go to sleep. 
everything. And if you do want to go to sleep, you have to pull down the uh, shades over your curtain and try and block out the sunlight and create a little bit of darkness for yourself so you can actually get some sleep. So outside the station is the ceremonial South Pole marker. So it's this uh, very, very nice pole here with this uh, shiny ball on top and the flags of all the countries that signed the Antarctic Treaty. Um, so this is often used for lots of photo shoots. So you can see I've got the photo of my reflection in the ball there. It looks very nice. But this is not the actual geographic South Pole of the Earth. So the actual South Pole is about 200 meters away down at one end of the base. So that's got this marker here. So what happens, the whole ice sheet is very gradually sliding over the rock beneath. So the South Pole is staying where it is, but the ice sheet is moving and taking the base with it. So the ceremonial marker was originally in the correct place, but in the years since, it's been dragged away. So they have a separate geographic marker, which they update every year. So they put the geographic marker in the right place the South Pole, the ice sheet moves a bit, the next year they move it again. So it's about five meters every year. So this here is the exact South Pole of the Earth. They've got the uh, marker that they change every year. Uh, you might probably can't see it here. There's a little compass marker here showing the different directions. So there's north, 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 and north. <laughs> so there are a couple of different buildings scattered around the place at the South Pole Station. There's the main building where most people live, and there's a couple of labs and outlying areas. So to travel around between those, I've got a bunch of interesting vehicles, like this van here where they've replaced the wheels with tracks because they're a lot more effective in the snow. And they've got lots of snowmobiles to, to uh, drive around. They've got the, all these sleds attached, very useful for carrying cargo or occasionally people if you feel like taking a, bit of, taking a bit of a break. So we ended up staying at the South Pole Station for four weeks. We got delayed by um, there was some bad weather, so our plane couldn't come in, and then we had some mechanical prob problems, so the plane couldn't get in. And so we were delayed there for a while, so we ended up staying there over Christmas. So we had a nice Christmas at the South Pole in the snow, and we got to experience one of the uh, crazy traditions they have down there which is called the Race Around the World. <laughs> so they have, it's a three kilometer fun run course that, that goes around the station and around the South Pole marker. So technically you're running all the way around the world. <laughs> and it's done in fancy dress and the whole base joins in. So uh, this is me here dressed up as a pirate running around at the South Pole. And a couple of other my teammates is Nick dressed up as a Hercules. Um, these people here in the sled, they, they're being pulled by snowmobiles, so they're just taking it easy. Because it is quite difficult. It's still at 3,000 meters, so there's not much oxygen, and minus sort of 20 degrees, so it's really, really cold. But I, I can now say that I have run around the world dressed as a pirate. <laughs> All right, enough uh, messing around at the South Pole. The final part of our journey is to get out to the telescope at Ridge A. So it's all the way out here. So that's actually, that's still quite a long distance there. That's about a thousand kilometers. So to get there, we fly out on one of these. This is a twin otter transport aircraft. So they're a lot smaller than a Herc. It's only really big enough to carry our team of four plus all of our cargo. And I mentioned it's quite a long way, a thousand kilometers. So the plane can't fly all the way there and back in one tank of fuel. So they have to stop halfway to uh, refuel the plane. So there's a uh, cache of fuel called A-Gap. So we had to stop there. So you see we've got all the barrels of fuel just in the snow. And there's some flags nearby to mark it so the pilots can see. And that's it. That's a fuel cache in Antarctica. So we had to stop and dig all the barrels out of the snow and haul them up here so the pilots could uh, get all the fuel out and refuel the plane and take us all the way out to Ridge A, our final destination. So this is it. This is out at the, uh, one of the most remote points in Antarctica, Ridge A. So the temperature here is minus 35 degrees while we were there in summer. And that's, that's the warmest that it gets. So it's a, it's a very cold place. And what you can see in the photos is pretty much all there is. There's our equipment that were put in the snow and then nothing else. There's no buildings, no people, no hills. Just, just a flat plain of white out to the horizon, as far as you can see. Um, I said it's minus 35 degrees there while we're there in summer. But in winter, it gets a lot colder. It might get as cold as minus 93. That's according to some satellite measurements, which would possibly make it one of the, the coldest places in the world. So that's, that's why we go there in summer. It's a bit, bit cold there in winter. Um, so these, uh, box, these things here are all the equipment we've set up. So this yellow box is full of electronics and computers, and that's, that's all the control systems for the telescopes that processes the data and uh, receives instructions and things like that. This uh, black cube over here is a cube of solar panels. So that provides all the power for the telescope in the summer when the sun's up. 
Um, there's another box, which is not in these photos, which is uh, green, about the same size as this, and it has two diesel engines in it. And they provide power over the winter when it's dark. So the sun's below the horizon, can't use solar power. So we've got a couple of diesel engines that power the telescope um, throughout the dark winter months. And the last thing is a telescope itself, which is this little blue box right here. So our telescope is called HEAT. It stands for High Elevation Antarctic Terahertz Telescope. Um, it's a fairly small telescope. It's, it's about the size of a barbecue, maybe. You can see a person there standing next to it. Uh, so this is it with the, this is the cover on it, and then we take the cover off. You can see the mirrors underneath. So I mentioned it's a terahertz telescope. So it picks up terahertz radiation from carbon atoms out in space. And so that, that comes down through the atmosphere through this little window here, which is transparent to terahertz radiation. So it comes down, bounces off that big mirror, bounces off that mirror there, off this little mirror at the side here, and into this detector here. Um, so it's quite a small telescope. The reason for that is that we are limited in the size of anything we can take to Ridge A by the doors on the Twin Otter plane. So anything bigger than that doesn't fit, we can't take it. So that's why we've got all these small modules. Yeah, uh, question? Um, the, the mirrors, are they parabolic or other conic sections? Um, they are parabolic. This one's just a flat mirror, so it's just angling the, the rays that come down to this one. Uh, these ones are parabolic, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so heat has been out there for about four years now operating. Um, it's mapping carbon, it's trying to map carbon in the entire galaxy eventually. Well, it, it's slowly scanning, slowly building up a picture of hopefully the entire galaxy. Um, you can also see it's up on legs like the South Pole Station, so we're trying to avoid the snow piling up against it too much. You can see in this photo the uh, instrument module's got a lot of snow piled up against the side. So you have to dig that all away before you can um, start using it. Uh, so this is a pretty cool photo I took. It, it looks like I've just gone and taken a photo of my thumb, which I, I have done, but what I'm doing here is I'm holding my thumb out at arm's length and I'm blocking out the sun. So the sun is behind my thumb in this photo here. And so what this shows is how clear the atmosphere is. There's no dust, there's no pollution, there's no clouds, there's no water vapor. It's just absolutely clear, so you get no scattered light. So if you tried this here in Sydney, there'd still be a huge blinding glare in the sky, so don't, don't do that. But in Antarctica, you can, you can block out the, the disk of your sun the disk of the sun with your thumb and see nothing. There's no sign of it. So uh, this is me working at Bridge A. It gets, it's pretty cold, minus 35 degrees. So whenever I breathe out, the water vapor in my breath freezes onto my face, and hence all the ice everywhere. Um, but even at minus 35 degrees, it, you can um, operate quite well with all the warm clothing we have. Um, so you kind of, you need to be generating your own body heat to stay warm. So you need to make sure that you're eating lots of food to keep yourself warm. You need to drink lots so your blood is flowing so it can transport the heat round to your fingertips. And you need to keep moving. So if you sit still and work on something for too long, you'll get cold. So you have to stop, get up, walk around, swing your arms, try and generate a bit more heat. Um, there's a bunch of interesting challenges. Like you have a water bottle with you, but you have to keep it on the inside of your jacket to stop it from freezing. And um, I'm wearing the goggles there because the entire landscape is very reflective, so it's all blinding white. So you can see like, in the background of this photo, my phone can barely pick anything up because it's blinding whiteness. So you've got to wear the goggles pretty much the entire time. Um, but even, it is really cold, but it's also quite beautiful in a sense. You get these little ice crystals growing up out of the ground just everywhere you can see. Because it's so cold and there's very little wind, ice crystals can sort of form up out of everywhere and grow up out of the ground to get these little fragile crystals everywhere. I felt a little bit bad about walking all over them. <laughs> so we stayed out at Ridge A for five days, which meant that we had, uh, there are no buildings there to stay in, so we had to camp out in the snow. So this is where I lived for the uh, five-day period. I've got my tent just set up there in the snow. They are in the sun, so they warm up a little bit. So they're, not, they're a bit warmer than minus 35, but they're still pretty cold inside. The, the floor is just but touching the snow. So if you have anything in your tent that you don't want to freeze when you're sleeping there overnight, you have to put it inside your sleeping bag with you so you can keep it warm with your body heat. So any clothes you'd like to wear the next day or your, your water bottle or anything will have to sit next to you. Anything you put on the ground will be in contact with the snow and will be frozen solid the next day. Um, but the sleeping bags we had were amazing. They're called snowy owls and I was nice and warm even in these crazy temperatures. On the first night there I was getting a bit too hot, which is surprising. Um, this here is the kitchen tent where we had our meals. You can see it there in the two photos. 
Um, so we have our field guide with us who was looking after us, making sure we didn't do anything too silly. And uh, she spent most of her time there making water for us to drink. So to get water, you can just dig up snow from pretty much anywhere and melt it because it's nice and pure. The problem is that snow is very light and fluffy and water is pretty dense. So you dig up a huge amount of snow, put it over the camp stove, melt it, and you get a little pool of water for everyone to drink. So she spent most of the time going out, shoveling snow, bringing it back, melting it to make, just to make water so that we'd have water to drink and uh, food to eat. Um, the food we had was um, surprisingly good. It's basically anything you can have frozen and then you can cook it over a camp stove. So we had a little set of camp stoves. So we had spaghetti and meatballs one night and um, we had uh, rice and curry another night. And then a couple of nights we just had the dehydrated food, so the packets where you just add the boiling water and it cooks itself because that's a lot quicker to make. And we had quite a lot of dehydrated food. We had, I think, weeks and weeks supply at Red J, all buried in the snow. So we're in no danger of running out. Um, a bit of a challenge when you're eating your food is that you put it in the bowl and then it starts freezing from the outside in. So you need to try and eat it quickly, otherwise you're going to have a layer of frozen food on your bowl that you can't get off because you're there for five days and you can't wash anything. So it, just, it sort of it combines all the meals together a little bit over the time. But that does mean that sort of things don't really get dirty. Like you see we've just left our bowls lying around the place. Because it's so cold there, you're effectively inside a freezer. Bacteria don't grow, there are no bugs, there's no dirt anywhere, there's just snow. So actually everything's surprisingly clean, it's uh, very interesting. Uh, so Ridge A is up at 4,000 meters elevation, so it's up very high, the air is quite thin there. So it's, it's difficult to breathe, you get out of breath doing anything, just walking a few paces. And it's even worse when you're wearing a huge amount of clothing and the heavy boots, and then you have to shovel snow away from the instruments so that you can access them. So it was uh, an exhausting task. I think I was out of breath most of the time I was there. Uh, but we did have a job to do. So we had to get, basically get heat working again. So this is uh, my colleague Nick working on the instrument module, which you can see he's got it unfolded there and it's all full of electronics and cables and batteries and wiring. And so those are all the control systems for the telescope. So he has to find any that aren't working, take them out, put the replacement ones in, connect all the cables up, test that they're working, find anything that's not, take it out, as we get all that working again. Um, we've got a tent over the heat telescope, so it's under there. We've got the cover taken off and just left in the snow. Um, so David was working on the heat telescope the whole time, replacing the cryostat with a new one. Um, the other thing to do is work on the engines. So we've got two diesel engines there which provide power over the winter, and you're supposed to do maintenance on diesel engines fairly regularly, like you take your car to the, to the shop to get it worked on. But we put two engines in Antarctica and try and run them all year. So they always break down before the end of the year, which means that we have to take in a new set of engines and take the old ones out and put the new ones in and connect everything up. So that's what we're doing here. The two engines are up on top there, and this bottom bit is all full of fuel. So we're taking the old engines off and we're attaching the new ones at that point. Um, so this big green box is there's insulation to keep them warm because it's quite hard to start engines when they're cold. So it's especially hard when it's at minus 90 degrees. And it's actually lined with uh, lamb's wool, because it turns out that's a very good uh, insulating material down here. And so we spent the five days at Ridge A working the entire time. There's pretty much no free time. They only stopped to have meals and have drinks and then sleep. But we managed to get everything done just in time for the plane to come back and pick us up. And we were very glad to see that plane. It's, it's a long time to be outside at minus 35 degrees. So the Twin Otter flew in, picked us up, uh, took us back to the South Pole Station. And it was fantastic to get back inside somewhere warm again. That's one of the, an amazing experience just to come back inside somewhere and have a, have a meal at the South Pole Station that isn't freezing. And I can have my glass of water, and that's not freezing either. And it's, it's amazing. Uh, so then we were at the South Pole for a, a couple of days. Then we flew back to McMurdo on another Hercules. And then finally, we took a Hercules from McMurdo Station back to Christchurch. And it was, it was really, really nice to get back to, to somewhere that's, that's normal, where there are plants and trees and animals and other people, and you can, you can walk outside, things aren't freezing. One of the interesting things I noticed when I got back to Christchurch was that I could smell things. I noticed that there were trees and flowers. That as soon as I stepped off the plane, I could smell them. And in Antarctica, there aren't any plants or anything, so it sort of just didn't notice that there were no smells. It's only engine grease if you're working on the engines. It's sort of amazing to, to think that all the, I don't know, things you just take for granted. Uh, so Antarctica was an absolutely amazing experience, but it's also very nice to get back to somewhere a bit more habitable. 
Uh, so Heat uh, was operating all of 2015, so that's after the work we did. So it's been doing its survey of uh, molecular clouds in our galaxy. So this is an artist's impression of what our galaxy looks like. Our sun is down there, and there's a few spiral arms coming off this galactic center. But this is only an artist's impression, so it's what we think the galaxy looks like, but we don't know exactly. So a lot of this stuff on the far side is unknown. We've got, we've got a, sort of a good idea of stuff nearby, but far away we don't really know. So we're hoping that uh, Heat will be able to help with that. So I've got some data from Heat here. We've got, uh, looking in this direction, we've got a little, uh, little block of Heat data that slices through a couple of the spiral arms of our galaxy. And so this here, if I get the video to work, Okay, so this is a little animation. So this is some actual data from heat showing you um, several molecular clouds. So this slices through several of the spiral arms. So you can see those three uh, chunks through uh, spiral arm there. And this is one square degree of sky. And so we've got, this is just a little bit of the data. We've got a lot more. We've been, trying to, been scanning the whole galaxy, eventually trying to build up a whole picture. And so hopefully heat will continue running in the future and get more data, and eventually it will be able to tell us a bit more about how molecular clouds uh, form and basically the lifetime of the stars. So, thank you. <laughs>